I, I'm going to give you some historic details of how people came at having an idea that such a thing uh, as approximate number system uh, exists, right? Because it's not obvious, right? How would we know that? And then uh, that will bring me to uh, speaking about a core cognition paradigm. Uh, and it's one of the leading paradigms in the contemporary number cognition uh, science. Uh, and it has been more or less introduced already, but I'm going to speak about it uh, like a bit differently. And then I'm going to introduce uh, another level uh, of this whole story, namely the language, right? Because when you think about it from a philosophical perspective, which is mine, uh, even if you want to remain a realist and you want to overcome, in a way, uh, the Benassarov's challenge, right, that Helen uh, mentioned, that you cannot be realist and have a good epistemological story for your, for your position. Uh, well, the thing that you probably would like to do uh, is to say, okay, so I, you know, I use language and if I can get information about this um, Platonist objects, it probably will happen uh, through the use of language. So this will be my perspective and uh, the concrete philosophical problem that I'm going to discuss and show you how I think that the research in number cognition is useful in philosophy is in the context of foundations of mathematics, right? Good. So what is ANS? So the most broadly speaking is a cognitive system that is responsible for processing, processing quantitative information. How does it work? Okay, so we have Alice and Alice is attacked by cards. So what she sees she sees cards coming on her, right? But she does not really, she, she, she's in a situation she cannot really count them. So Alice is looking at the cards and she's like approximating the number with some unique symbolic representation, right? This is what approximate system is about in a nutshell. It is quantity specific. It is modality independent. So here you saw an example of, of a visual input, but we can observe the same kind of um, representation for auditive or a tactile input, right? So if you hear several times, um, uh, several times some sounds, then your, the representation, the reaction of your brain uh, will be guided by the same um, but by the same principles or will be activated in the same way uh, in this, by this approximate number system uh, as for the visual input. And you get, as Helen already said, only approximations of those quantities. Good, so how would we get to the idea that people actually have such a cognitive system? So um, if I'm speaking about Piaget, it's not because he spoke about any kind of core cognition. On the contrary, he believed that there is no such a thing. He thought that all the mathematical development in children goes purely by um, experience, internalization, and kind of abstraction of properties and regularities in the world. That there is like nothing such uh, as an innate uh, system of knowledge about numerosity. But his research, uh, his experiments, as you are going to see in a moment, uh, were, in, um, like, were an inspiration for other people uh, who was going in a direction of showing that actually uh, this is what uh, psychologically happens, this is um, how it works. Uh, so here uh, I'm, I'm showing you uh, an experiment which is uh, extremely famous. Uh, it is ca called number conservation task and it consists in showing children a gr two groups of marbles, right? So in the first stage of the experiment, children are, sh are showed two rows of marbles uh, and they are asked, oh, is there the, the same number of uh, marbles 
uh, in the two rows or is there more marbles in one of the rows? And then the children, they say, usually even like four years old or three years old, they reply, oh yeah, this is the same, it's okay. But then, without changing the number of elements, but just spreading the row below, uh, the same question is asked. Is there, is there more in one of the rows, or is the same number of elements? And then the children say, do I have a pointer here? Yes. Then say, here, uh, here is more, right? Which shows that numbers are not, the numerosity is not preserved, it's not conservated by changing the disposition of the elements. And uh, so that was one of the, of the reasons for which Piaget was saying, oh, children, they don't have a sense of numbers. They don't know. They need to learn. There are like more things that have to happen in order to them to understand numerosity. And then this experiment has been cha challenged uh, in 1967. Uh, at this stage, it wasn't about finding out number cognition yet, uh, but Meller and Beaver uh, in, uh, at MIT, uh, they changed the context. So instead of marbles, in a part of the experiment, they were using candy. And the children, so there were like two, um, two different stages of this experiment. They showed children in the first stage they were still using marbles or like, you know, uh, pieces of clay or something completely uninteresting for a child, a priori. Uh, and they were asking, oh, is there the same number uh, or there is more in one of them? No, this is the same, uh, we're saying <laughs> children. And then instead of just spreading um, the, the elements, they were putting six elements in the row below, right? Uh, and the question was uh, repeated, right? And then the, ch the children, uh, so I'm going to tell you about how, what happened to the children because it's extremely interesting. Uh, and after uh, the marbles were replaced by the candy and children were said, well, which one do you prefer? You can keep one of the rows. And uh, as you can guess, children were keeping this one. <laughs> And what was extremely interesting about it, that children behaved differently depending on their age. So children as small as two and a half to three and a half, oh, sorry, were answering to both of conditions correctly, right? So small children, the two years old or three years old, they were saying that here is more. But then, suddenly, only children that were, uh, so, um, and, the, and then, the, so, so, and then suddenly children who were between three and a half and four and a half started to perform correctly only with these tasks when they had to, you know, get the candy for them, but they were failing, this one. So more was here again. And when they, the children, were growing, so four and a half years old were starting to perform correctly on both conditions again, right? So there was like a strange gap in the middle that no one could explain. And so people started to discuss it and think about it. But one of the conclusions was already children do have some sort of sense of numerosity, even when they are really, really small. This experiment, uh, like explicitly about existence of number cognition, has been conducted in the 80s. Uh, so people uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, Starkey and, uh, his, co uh, and his colleagues, uh, they tested uh, children, um, so 16 is what, it's like four months old till seven months old, so really, you know, small infants. Uh, and they were showing them pictures, so they were, you, like they, they were habituating them. Yeah, so maybe a, a little bit about methodology. So how do you study, so how do you test anything which has such a small child? So you realize that the child gets bored. And when a child gets bored, child stops looking. 
right? So you're measuring how long a child is looking at some interesting situation, and when the situation gets boring, then the child will stop looking, right? So this is the and so when when the situation gets interested again, is interesting again, the looking time will be longer. So uh, what they have uh, tested uh, in 1980, so they first habituated the children to look at two dots. So that was two alienated dots that were changing position. It was always a line, not to you know, like to to try to to to, to just concentrate on numerosity and and the other properties of the situation. Uh, and when, when a child were completely uninterested in those two dots, they were showing her three dots, and then the child were getting interested again, right? So we're looking at the situation longer. The same experiment has been repeated for the children as young as two to three days old, three years later, and there, uh, so it was not about measuring uh, the time of um, observation, uh, they were um, looking at the sucking uh, of, a, um, um, yeah, of the, some device that, you know, could measure uh, how interested are children uh, in a changing situation. And even more convincing were uh, the experiment which was conducted again in the early 80s uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, where again to, it was like this t the, like differentiation between two elements and three elements, but instead of dots, they were using um, they were using very familiar um, objects. So they were ch showing a child like sets of two objects, like a plane, like a drawing of a plane and of a doll, and then and a plane and a little house, and then the doll, which is a little bit bigger, and then the and then the plane, and then they were like like alienating them in different ways to really make sure that it is not about the object. This is really about the number of objects in the picture, and then when child was completely bored by the situation, they were showing them, uh, they were showing this child three objects, again from the sam same set of objects, so it would be like a plain doll in a house. That child have seen again, uh, uh, already, already many times, but now this time, instead of two objects, there were three objects, and they observed again uh, that children uh, realized that there was a difference. So that was like a very important observation uh, that there is uh, actually something which is going on uh, with pre-verbal children. Uh, another type of experiments uh, in the 90s, so this one is extremely, extremely well known, uh, so I will tell you about it. Uh, it was Karen Wynn uh, who in the 1992 um, in Yale uh, conducted the following experiment, uh, which is well known for one of the first works, or for the first work, uh, about uh, children um, arithmetical abilities, right? So uh, children addition and children subtraction. So what was happening is that, so you, can, you have to imagine this child, so the child is sitting there uh, looking at the puppet theater, right? So there's a puppet theater and there are two Mickey Mouses. Uh, so, I mean, there are two in general, but for the moment the child uh, just see one Mickey Mouse sitting there. And then there's a screen, right? So no Mickey Mouse for the moment, but a child is, so maybe I should do it like this, right? So one Mickey Mouse. And then the screen, and then there's a hand which comes, and the child see, as you can see on this uh, third picture, putting another Mickey Mouse behind the screen. And then the hand goes without any object. And then there are two possible, possible situations. In the first one, the screen goes down and there are two Mickey Mouse. No surprise, no looking longer, <laughs> expected. But when there's just one Mickey Mouse sitting there, because someone you know, of course you know, right? You had the screen and then the hand came here and then, but the child didn't know. Just one Mickey Mouse and then, right? Or very intense staring at that. So this, kind, this experiment has been published in Nature and got really a lot of influence and a lot of discussions. Uh, again, suggesting that there is something going on. In 1997, 
Stanislas Dean, a French researcher, a neuropsychologist uh, from uh, his formation. Uh, he has written a very influential book that I actually <laughs> advised you to read uh, for this course or like parts of it. And I still uh, strongly advise you to do that if you want to learn, like start to learning about number, number cognition because it's a, you know, it's, there's like a lot of things missing. It has been first written in 1997. Then there was like a revised, but not really revised version in 2011. But there's like a lot of starting points uh, and a lot of information and it's a very nice reading. So uh, if you want to go uh, and learn something about uh, number cognition, you definitely should read this book. Uh, so uh, Dehan, he formulated um, a concept of number sense, which is this very basic capacity to process quantities. And it's, his, his research has been extremely strongly based uh, on the observation from the evolutionary research uh, that Helen spoke about quite a lot today. Uh, there was, for example, an extremely uh, important uh, book written by Gallistel uh, seven years before, it was 1990, uh, in which uh, different uh, evolutionary explanations of uh, concepts that are used by humans uh, were put forward. Then Elizabeth Spelke, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, she, for, for the first time, started to speak about core cognition, which was this preverbal, innate, often shared with animals uh, ability that participate in inferential context, contexts. So when you f think about core cognition, then you should, so they say that, so people who are speaking about it say that you should differentiate that from sensory, just purely sensory information. Uh, for example, a core cognitive system is a system that Lawrence described at chickens. That has been mentioned already as well, right? When a child, when, when a chicken imprints in some moving big object, this is a core cognitive system which is in play. And this core cognitive system is not just a pure observation of the external world, it serves to something because this chicken will behave accordingly to how this core cognitive system told the chicken to behave. So um, core cognition for mathematics uh, is what I'm going to speak about now. But people are studying core cognitive system in different settings as well. If you look at what Karen Wynne, so the one from the, you know, the, um, the puppet theater experiment, the addition and subtraction experiment, what she's doing now in her lab uh, is studying core cognitive systems for ethics, right? So whether good or collaborative um, position or behaviors are preferred uh, on a very basic levels uh, to non-cooperative behaviors. And I will not comment on that. It's like extremely interesting and very uh, challenging topic. Uh, if you want to, to look at that, you can. Uh, then, so core cognition. So there are two systems of core cognition. Uh, again, you know about it already, so it will be, it might, makes my task so much easier. Uh, so uh, again, think about Alice. Uh, so Alice is seeing a rabbit, right? So what happens is in her head, there is a representation of a rabbit, a single rabbit. It does not necessitate any external, additional, symbolic representation. It's just token, right? As Helen said, sometimes called object file. If Alice see four rabbits, then still it will work. However, when there is much more rabbits, and as you know, rabbits, they multiply quite quickly following the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, I have not followed Fibonacci sequence here, but maybe for the next talk I will. That will be funny. Um, so what happens for Alice in this case? Well, you remember when she saw the cards, it will be exactly the same. 
right? So she will have a representation which will be like magnitude, um, analog magnitude representation. It will be like one symbol in some sense for uh, the objects that she's uh, objects, like a set of discrete objects that she's observing. So uh, when, you, when you think about it, like to, if you want to, to sum it up, this is how the situation works. In parallel individuation, for all observed objects, you have three different objects, right? So you see three dogs, then you have dog, 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 right? There's no need to, to put one symbol on it. However, when you start going approximate number system, then you are making a symbol for it, but it's just approximation, right? So I'm going to speak about how this approximation works uh, in this talk. Well, so how do we study number cognition? And this is what I thought that Helen talk will be about, actually, when I read the abstract. So I will tell you what I thought the argument for realism <laughs> might have been. <laughs> And so, you have to formulate a very strong hypothesis, namely that there exists a quantity-specific core cognitive system that has these properties of being evolved in innate and preverbal, and how you can know even conceptually that such a thing exists, if not by having this concept already, right? So before, so Piaget, couldn't say that, even if he had already the system of, you know, uh, of names for numbers. But that was like a necessity to have it in order to be able to speak about it. So that, that was, I thought, that the uh, argument will be about. And I actually saw a presentation by Marco Panza, one fellow from Paris, uh, putting that uh, in more or less... Um, uh, those lines. Good. So first of all, uh, so how do so? So my question here is how like, we can study number cognition uh, if we don't really know if it exists, right? I mean, where do we have an evidence for the existence of such a thing? So animal studies you have seen really a lot, and really I I felt like. Uh, Helen's talk was really completing uh, what I'm going to say because I will really skip very quickly <laughs> over what animal studies are, right? I will just say, well, uh, it has been studied uh, with birds, pigeons, crows, uh, ravens, uh, also big apes and uh, many different other animals uh, that uh, they will have a preference in uh, evolutionary justified context, you know, like children preferring this, those candies over less candies, they will rather go here than there, right, to get the grains that they want to eat. Uh, then psychology studies are done today on this, and now we are still, like, think about something which happens before you have the language to speak about it, right? So this non-symbolic representations uh, that are uh, issued from uh, approximate number system uh, in reaction to the input from the external world, right? So think about the situation. I'm getting in this room, I'm standing here, I'm giving a talk, and then my brain does do, 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 and it's like 40, huh? Because uh, this is what I now think, what I approximate that you are here. Maybe I wasn't that exact, but I'm concentrated on other things, right? So, uh, so this research has, is done with children, uh, and it does not go in a way uh, in which I just described, because as you can see, I compared or I used the symbolic representation 40, and here we are not allowed to do that. So what we are doing? We are using comparisons, right? So now we are going to work. Where is more? Yellow or blue? <laughs> Good. <laughs> But that was slow, that should be quick, you know? So the difference is between 14 and 6, and you should see that immediately. Where is more? Yes, blue, still good. It was even quicker, but I understand that it was a little bit of you being shy. Where is more? Huh? Yeah, no. <laughs> good. Blue. So, 
this is one of the of the experiments that are uh, that I've done and the con conclusions uh, that are taken out of it. Uh, I'm going to speak about them in a moment. I will just say um, again, without getting uh, into into any details, uh, it has been observed uh, also uh, in making like similar kind of studies. Uh, uh, with people who were like control of what's going on in their brain, which parts of the brain are getting activated. So we realized, and Helen, she said really much more about it than I, I will, uh, that, that in this like inferior parietal cortex get activated uh, the quantity representation. So this, this comes from the, this image comes from, uh, from the Hannes book. Good. And, uh, well, so what we have learned, right, from this experiments, from the three, three different ways of studying uh, approximate number systems, uh, so we have learned that um, the conclusions are that these cardinal values are represented by an analog magnitudes, right? So <coughs> inputs get bigger, representation gets bigger, right? So when you remember Alice looking at the rabbits, that was her representation. <laughs> More rabbits, bigger the representation. More rabbits, the representation is even bigger. And then when you think about how it can be studied from the mathematical perspective, well, mathematicians or cognitive scientists interested in modeling, uh, they were thinking about um, what will be the like representation uh, about the situation. And they proposed two models. So this is the one uh, uh, based on logarithmic scale, right? So since like here the confusions get bigger, right? So it seems to be, uh, to be like a correct representation. But you can think about it also uh, on a, a linear scale and just saying that um, what happens like the brain activation uh, is getting more, more or less flat farther you go, right? So here you can distinguish much less between 10, uh, like 10 and 8 and 12, uh, but farther you go, flatter it gets, right? So, uh, so this is like the linear model with color variability. And uh, this kind of uh, experiments or this kind of thinking uh, and this one, uh, yeah, so there's like a discussion uh, which, of the, which of the models uh, more accurately uh, models what's going on with the approximate number cognition. Uh, and um, Francis Galton in 1881 uh, has been talking to many people uh, studying their ability to do synesthesia, so like a visualization uh, of some numeric, of, for example, numer numerical um, objects. And uh, this is how the, the model that he came up uh, uh, in the study looks like. So you have like, you know, quite a detailed beginning from one to six, four to 10, and then it goes to 100 in a like, more or less regular way. And after it starts to, to have like, different like, strange things going on in here. And for what Deanne uh, is claiming is that this is one of the reasons uh, for which we should rather prioritize the logarithmic, um, logarithmic model rather than the linear one. Uh, similarly, uh, in, a pa in another paper, Deanne, uh, is thinking that uh, studies on the Munduruku and uh, Piranha, uh, so the two cultures, and I will make, so um, Helen, she mentioned that very briefly, uh, and I will, I can tell you a little bit more, more about it. So those two tribes uh, which live, so Munduruku, they live somewhere in the Amazonian forest. I'm not sure where Piranha live. I think that like more or less in the, uh, in the same area. And we have realized that those tribes don't have stable names for numerals over four or five maybe, right? So they have stable name for what is one, for what is two, what is three, what is four. And after it goes one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So after it's a lot, and if they want to compare two sets, they need to put objects in one-to-one -one correspondence, maybe using marbles or maybe using something else, which allows them to see uh, in, which, um, uh, in which set there is more objects. 
And when Munduruku were asked to represent uh, natural numbers uh, on a line, right? So they were, they were like in some way which is known to them, right? They were shown like one object here and maybe like six here that they can like more or less approximate where it is. Uh, they would use the logarithmic scale, right? So they will put the two quite, a, quite away and then three a little bit closer and then it will just go closer and closer. So that would be uh, the argument that um, the uh, approximate number system actually forms a logarithmic progression. Uh, good. So uh, I told you that uh, I'm going to tell you what comes out from the experiment I just conducted on you. <laughs> and you almost confirmed uh, what uh, we know about the behavior of the approximate number system. Uh, so uh, it is a subject of two effects. The first effect is called distance effect. Uh, and we realize that comparing uh, some well distant um, uh, quantities is easier, right? So this is what happened, right? You were supposed to see 10 to 6 immediately, but it took you time for other, other reasons. Uh, and it's much more difficult where those quantities are close by. Uh, and the other effect that uh, the um, approximate number system is a subject to is a size or magnitude effect. So for equal distances, performance decreases as numbers get larger, right? So uh, 2 to 3 is easier than 20 to 30, right? So the same ratio, but bigger, uh, bigger amount of objects. Uh, then you will, like a human being, uh, will uh, perform uh, slower and less accurately. Good. So as I have told you, uh, the input activated ANS is a sensory input, non-symbolic input, visual, auditive, tactile, everything that work, work, works uh, as good. Uh, but there is also, and now I'm going to the areas which I'm interested uh, in and when I think that uh, are very interesting to explore. Uh, this is the symbolic input. So quantifier, generalized quantifiers, or exact numerals. So in this talk, I'm going to concentrate on exact numerals, but um, um, I have done some work uh, on how the ANS uh, works in the context of some specific generalized quantifiers as well. Uh, good, so um, distance effect. This is hard, it's supposed to be hard. Which one is bigger? 71, good. And uh, it is the case. Which one is bigger? Should be easier, 29. Which one is easier? Uh, which one is bigger? Yeah, this one, good. And so uh, it has been observed that, and it was with the 65 in the middle, so uh, again, Meller, uh, Deanne, and uh, Emmanuel Dupuy, Dupuy, uh, in Paris, they, um, uh, they tested how well and how accurately and how fast people were respond to comparing uh, two digits uh, from Arabic numerals between 31 and 99 uh, as being smaller or larger than 65. And they have observed the exactly the same effect and exactly the same distribution as is observed and unknown for the dot or non-symbolic representations. So um, what does then ANS tells us about number words or numerals? I just had a discussion yesterday with Dirk uh, about my, me confusing uh, the word, the expression number word with the expression numeral. Uh, so think about that like, you know, like more or less the same. There are differences, but they are, I'm not concerned with them in this particular talk. So when I say number words or names for numbers or numerals, I mean the same. It's just the notalia. And when I say notation, I mean the same, right? It's like, 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 like uh, at, at this stage, uh, I, I think that I can uh, afford this confusion, although I recognize uh, that some more uh, scrutiny uh, might be even uh, better for, the, uh, for pushing this project forward. 
Okay, so both sets of objects and symbolic representations of uh, numbers evoke an ANS-related representation, right? So we just saw that. So um, what says cognitive scientists is that in addition to those two core cognitive systems that you know already everything about because three different people introduced them to, to, to you today, uh, there is another system uh, which is called linguistic number system and which is a system of names or numerals uh, or symbolic representations uh, that we are using in our culture, right? Um, so the most frequently in our Western culture, the uh, natural numbers are represented by Arabic numerals and it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Uh, you know that very well. And what is well known as well is that neither ANS or pi IS, so the stupidizing or uh, parallel individuation, enable humans to construct meaning of exact numeral numbers represented by linguistic number system, right? This is not enough. This is not, we, we, we cannot really explain how do we understand uh, natural, uh, natural numbers as we do uh, based only on those two core cognitive system. Uh, the mechanism of how children learn the meanings of higher exact numbers and how they grasp the general concept of natural numbers is still under debate, right? So two things that we cannot or we don't know how to use the results in number cognition for is to explain what, what are the meanings or how do we know the meanings of higher numbers uh, and what's in general the natural number. Uh, okay. So what does it really mean, right? Because so, so this is like, so I copied that from the previous slide, neither ANS nor PIS enable humans to construct meanings of exact natural numbers represented by uh, a linguistic number line. So that means that the conceptual content, this is how I understand it, right? This means that the conceptual content that people associate with exact numerals, it's not exhausted by the conceptual content, content that bring PIS or ANS. So how to think about it, right? What do I mean by this conceptual content, right? So, well, let's look at how numerals get meanings when it comes to small numbers. We know quite a lot about it. Um, so first of all, we know that children learn uh, the number line by heart. Right, so it comes, the mummy comes or the daddy comes uh, in the evening and they read a book which has numeral, names of numerals um, or numerals or names for numbers in it. And then the child, after some time, starts to have like this, you know, is able to repeat one name after another. And it is called a placeholder structure. The same expression is used by structuralists, actually, the placeholder structure, uh, in, a extra, in a, like a little bit different meaning. So this, this is used to what Helen showed, you know, with the football example, right? So this is a placeholder structure for them. Here, a placeholder structure is the sequence of names which are learned by heart and which are placeholders for the con conceptual content which can be put inside later on in the educational process. So in Sarnetska lab, and not all the research comes from Sarnetska lab, but I really think that she should be mentioned in this context. Uh, she was studying for many years uh, how children learn uh, content for numbers, the small numbers, one, two, three, four, and then we realized, so they realized, she realized, I mean, it's realized that when it comes to five, a child makes like a, like a cognitive jump, right? Or cognitive leak and understand what six, seven, eight, nine, ten, etc. So children learn the numbers, one by names for numbers, the first conceptual content which allows them to use uh, those expressions uh, or those symbols uh, in an accurate way, in sequence, one after another, and one, so not, not two in the same time, right? So first comes the one knowers. One knowers know that one means one, 
and that all the other numbers, right, because the child knows them by heart, they mean something else, right, than one. Two knowers, they know that one means one and two means two, but they make no distinction about, with other numbers. Then what is interesting, three knowers, they understand, in addition to, you know, knowing that other numbers, it's a different thing, uh, that all numbers apply to discrete entities, such as blocks, and not to continuous entities, such as water. Right? So there's like an additional conceptual content that comes into the picture. Four knowers understand that number words appearing later in the list denotes set, sets with more items as well. So they, they gain like additional conceptual content at every stage. And when they understand that when they become CP knowers, so cardinality principle knowers, and I will speak about cardinality principle in a second quite extensively, they understand that many things about number that children at earlier levels do not. Only CP knowers recognize that number words pick out numerosity as opposed to some other property of sets, such as total, assumed area, or a contour length, right? So this is extremely interesting. And so children, uh, when they are tested to know which exercises to make with them in order to improve their mathematical capacities, they are first tested to determine on which level they are. So an uh, experiment which is conducted consists, for example, in having an anteater. So Sornetka, she's at Irvine, and the anteater is the, you know, the toy of the university. So, oh, uh, this is an anteater, and anteater wants to eat bananas. And then the child has a, you know, little plate with plastic bananas. And, uh, oh, Right. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, yeah, my mistake. Good. So, um, yeah, so then the child is asked to give one banana or two bananas, and the child who is two knower is able to give, uh, to give two bananas, but it's not able to give three bananas. When the child who is two knower is supposed to give four bananas and gives five bananas, and the question is, oh, is that really two bananas? And then the child puts more, right? This is like the usual situation. Uh, which happens uh, in, this, uh, in this thing. Uh, okay, so we have the progression, and by subitizing or by uh, this first uh, information, the, uh, this um, um, parallel individuation system, we get uh, information for the four first numbers. Good. Um, then there's another concept that uh, I will try to explain you very briefly, uh, which is called the bootstrapping. Because so we, we knew how to go here, right? And now we have to do some kind of a leak, cognitive leak, in order to reach five and the other uh, um, number names. And Susan Curry in 2009 uh, introduced the concept of bootstrapping, uh, which came uh, by, uh, like, as inspiration uh, came Quine uh, with his uh, ideas from Word and Object. Uh, and the idea is that, um, like, on the contrary of what Fodor thought, when you are developing your conceptual um, content of your conceptual knowledge, uh, you don't have to use what you already have, so it's not about just maturing the concepts or having like joint concepts that make another concept. She says, okay, so like imagine a chimney, so those are points example, and then you, you know, push on like the, the sides to support yourself and to go up, and then there's like, you know, supervenient uh, new concept that is coming. Uh, and she's uh, claiming that in order to get the uh, um, concept of natural numbers, this is what is going to happen, what has to happen. So when you think about, you know, web of knowledge, so Kwanian idea uh, again, so you have one, two, three, four, you know already, right? And there's something has to happen, but it can happen on the, you know, somewhere else, right? And then the conceptual web does do 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 and then suddenly you start to understand what is five, six, seven, eight. But it's not because you understood what's five, but you understood something else, which made things fall into the right places. But it may be something else. Maybe it's not a successor. I just use successor uh, because this is what, uh, what Sarnetska uh, says in her research. So it might be 
that we get this from getting better with ANS acuity. Uh, because the ANS acuity, so your ability to approximate, gets better and better, right? So children who are three old, uh, they can do ratios two to three, but adults, and it's, again, so Western cultures, but Munduruku as well, uh, are getting to differentiate nine to ten, right? So this has been criticized. So there is just another, another thing about approximate number system uh, that Helen mentioned, that children that are, getting, that are better in approximating are better at school as well uh, with linguistic number system. So you mentioned who proved that, but I'm quoting people who are actually disproving that, showing that uh, there are children who are very good. So children from low SES, low social economic status families, they might be extremely good in approximating and extremely bad in using linguistic number system, right? Uh, so, uh, so this is like, you know, a discussion around it. Uh, but what, what, what is my question? And I'm really, you know, um, I will try to get through that quickly. Uh, which conceptual content do we get from the approximate number structure, uh, number system should be, uh, should be system? So we have reaction to discrete quantities and we have progression of magnitudes, right? But look at this number system. Uh, so this is, uh, this is again uh, from the Hannes book, uh, the picture comes, uh, and the system which is non-recursive numerical system which is based on uh, parts of the body, one, uh, one, two, three, four, five, and then how it was, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, etc. right? So it gives you some non-recursive notation, and my question was, would we, how we, what, what does it, what, whether we could learn or are we learning or can we, can we still uh, keep the axiomatic, uh, the approximate number system uh, coherent as an explication of how we learn this kind of system? And this is not what we do today. So this comes, this is my favorite quotation that comes from Borges, Funius de Memorius. Uh, he told me in the 8086 that he invented a numeric system original with himself, uh, that within a few, very few days he had passed the 24,000th mark. Instead of 7,013, he would say, for instance, Maximo Perez, instead of 7,014, the railroad. Other numbers were Louis Melian, La Finur, Olimar, Sulfur, Clubs, the Whale, Gas, Estupo, Napoleon, Augustin de Veda. Instead of 500, he said nine. Every word had a particular figure attached to it, a sort of marker. The later ones were extremely complicated. I tried to explain to Funius that his rhapsody of unconnected words was exactly the opposite of a number system. I told him that when he said 365, one said three hundreds, six tenths, and five ones, a breakdown impossible with the number Niger Timoteo, or a punchful or uh, meat. Uh, Funius either could not uh, uh, or would not understand me. Right? So when you think about this number system, can we still say the story about the number words uh, like this exp uh, being explained uh, by approximate number system? Well, you can. So what is missing to represent our system, which is recursive, because there is something missing. So it seems to me that what we not get is the idea of successor, which comes uh, with the cardinality principle. And the cardinality principle says that if you put one more object to your set of you know, approximate numbers, you don't need to know how many are here, you just put one more, then you move of one on your number line list, right? So you move of one further. Okay, so what we have learned that this conceptual content here, it comes from ANS to some extent because this is what grants us progression. This comes from cardinality principle because it grants you the successor. But can we not say the same story about the, you know, Maximo Perez Funius system? Yes, we can. So there is like still something missing. And so my question is, what is missing? 
So we don't get an idea of regularity, of the fact that between one element and another there is the same distance, right? This is what I claim. And I had some replies to that, but I thought that I will be late at this talk. And then I thought that it will be very frustrating for me and for you if I started to explain you what, how I think we could fix that. So, uh, yeah, you are welcome to search on my ResearchGate <laughs> website <laughs> for the paper about it. Or you can think about it yourself, right? What is missing? How one can fix that? Like, wh where does this information comes from? Right? And what we can do about it? Right, so, so the answer to the question we can do about it. And I have like really one minute now. It will be very quickly why philosophers should care. So there is a principle, so in philosophy you want to have foundations or not, right? If you want to have foundations, you can use some principle, like way of, you know, like um, um, principle, foundational principle that tells you how those foundations should look like. And one of the most famous uh, foundational principles is called Frege's constraint and it says that axiomatic system or a set of first principles or foundations of a mathematical theory is satisfactory when it, is, it accounts for applications of the entities from the intended model of the theory, right? Applications. So what are those applications? When you look at how the, the, the mathematical web looks like, it is like, you know, it's like interconnected. When you start to explain this one, then you find yourself uh, in a necessity of explaining some other one. So how would you stop in explaining what will be the, like, the, you know, what is like the basic principle that you are s supposed to use? And I think, and so in the case of natural numbers, cardinality and computability are probably the two competing ones. Uh, at the market, then pattern recognition with a little bit different flavor will come to the picture as well. Um, but how we can, what could be our, whether this mathematical cognition could tell us anything about having preference for one to another. So what I think one could do uh, is to say that optimality uh, would be a good um, uh, a good principle. So, which concepts shall we learn first in order to get to the mature mature number line? And it is very important. And that is really the last thing I'm saying. So, in the 2007, Duncan and uh, the colleagues uh, have uh, for, uh, written a paper. Uh, in which they go through, uh, it's like a meta-analysis of different database showing that early mathematical knowledge. So you take a five-year-old, you measure everything you can measure, you know, how long the child sits still, how good the language of the child is, how well she is drawing, and this numerosity. And there is a strong correlation only between early mathematical knowledge and later mathematical and not only mathematical achievements. So the child will just perform better in all the academic tasks later on if the child uh, were good in mathematics. So we really have an interest in figuring out uh, which are more optimal things that we should learn our children in order to learn the contemporary recursive system of names. And this is it, and I leave you with this quotation.